All right, well, good morning. Um, my name is Michael Lee. I'm the Senior Manager of Government Affairs at uh, Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. I appreciate you having me here today uh, to discuss legislative and regulatory topics impacting golf course management, impacting golf course superintendents. When, uh, when Mike McCall reached out to me and, and offered me the invite to come, I thought it was just a great opportunity to get in front of a sort of a different crowd for me. I, I do plenty of talks. Uh, with our superintendent chapters around the country, uh, but, but not always in front of uh, Green Committee chairman. Um, and I just think it's a great partnership that you have here between the superintendents and, and the Green Committee chairman. So I, I want to sort of fill you in on some of the various legislative regulatory issues that superintendents face year in and year out, um, as was mentioned, at the federal, state, and local level. Um, and, and ultimately, talking why, about why advocacy is important and how you can get involved in some of those issues. To get started, just a brief introduction of our government affairs team at GCSAA. Uh, Hava McKeel is in the middle of the picture there. She is our department director. She's been with GCSAA for, I think, about 25 years. So Steve, I don't know if you may have hired Hava, uh, but I know that she always really enjoyed working for you in the years that you were at the association as well. That also must mean that she started when she was about 12 years old. I, I'm not sure. Um, Bob Helen is our uh, Director of Congressional and Federal Affairs, he lives in Alexandria, Virginia. He's our man on Capitol Hill, working with congressional offices day in and day out. And Bob also is our liaison to a number of uh, coalitions that we do our work through at the federal level there in Washington, D.C. We'll talk a little bit about some of those coalitions today throughout my presentation as well. Finally, I manage state and local affairs for GCSAA, as well as our grassroots advocacy programs. Um, there's plenty of ways in which golf course management is impacted by, by laws and regs. The state level happens to be very challenging, and here in New York that couldn't be truer. Um, at the federal level, as you may know, things move quite slow. The wheels of government turn slowly, as you've heard before. At the state level, that's not necessarily the case, especially if you're in a state where there's single party control of the legislature and the governor's office. Things can move very quickly. Uh, Bob, congratulations on the award. Uh, no one is more deserving of the award than Bob Nielsen. Bob and I have done a lot of work together in the advocacy space, and Bob's a massive champion for the golf industry. Uh, in Albany, he knows very much uh, how true it is that uh, golf course management is impacted by laws and regulations, especially at the state level. So we'll, we'll touch on some of that as well. The goal of my presentation is to give you a better understanding of public policy issues impacting golf course management. Again, three levels of government. Uh, although I don't think that I have any local examples specifically in the presentation, we can certainly talk about some of those if there's questions about things going on uh, in your area. But ultimately, I want to give you um, an understanding of the issues and an understanding of opportunities to engage on those issues through GCSA programs to hopefully give you a better outcome on some of these proposed laws and regulations. Everything we do at GCSA Government Affairs is within our priority issues agenda that is put together by our Government Affairs Committee. Every two years, the committee is made up of nine superintendents from around the country. And in the 2023 and 24 edition, we have a new section on power equipment. Uh, you may have heard of some of the power equipment issues coming up at the state level. This is not really a federal issue, but currently it is a state and local issue uh, whereby legislatures are con considering laws to limit the types of power equipment power equipment that can be used, including many types of equipment used on golf courses, so we'll get into that as well. Uh, I'll have some QR codes on my slides throughout the presentation. If you want to scan any of those to take a deeper dive into any of these issues, please feel free to do so. At the federal level, these are kind of the big four buckets that we focus on. And just think about everything that it takes to maintain a golf course. Those are the things that we try to focus on for golf course superintendents. And so we'll dive into each one of these buckets. First thing I'm going to touch on is on water. And this is WOTUS. You've probably heard of the WOTUS issue, Water of the United States. Now, why is there a groundhog on my slide? Well, frankly, it's Groundhog's Day all over again at the federal level with this issue. We're now on the third administration in a row, okay, so think Obama, Trump, Biden, uh, who have wanted to implement their own version of a Waters of the United States rule. And so what is Waters of the United States? It's not about clean water. It's not about dirty water. It's not about pollution. It's about jurisdiction. It's about which level of government is going to regulate water bodies. WOTUS determines which waters the federal government will have regulatory jurisdiction over. And so the Trump EPA repealed the expansive Obama rule uh, during their time in office and implemented their own navigable waters protection rule. 
that focused on large bodies of water. When Congress passed the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, they very much stated that the federal government should have regulatory just jurisdiction over large bodies of water. Think interstate commerce, okay, so think the Hudson River, Long Island Sound, Gulf of Mexico, Mississippi River, etc., the country's ports. There's no doubt those are under federal jurisdiction, but they said the states have a role to play in water regulation as well. Unfortunately, the Obama rule kind of stomped on states' authority. The Trump administration uh, withdrew that. Now we're going back to the Biden administration who is doing something similar to what the, the Obama administration pursued uh, during their time in office. So we've been involved in each one of these efforts uh, for the past eight years uh, that we've seen this, this type of proposal. Um, on your screen is sort of the different types of water bodies that you see the federal government focus on. And this comes from the Trump era. Uh, the waters that were jurisdictional there on the left side of the screen. So again, the traditional navigable waters. And then you have other stream and creek types, those that uh, connect to those federal waters. Those were under federal control. Um, and, and a number of other categories. What's concerning to us about the Biden administration rule that they've implemented is that they pull a number of other water body types under uh, federal jurisdiction, especially ephemeral waters. These are streaks and cr uh, creeks and streams that only sometimes have water in them. Think after a rain event, you'll find water in them and they'll be flowing. Otherwise, they could be dry land. Um, Bob and I were talking earlier about this. There's a version of this introduced in New York as well. A Class C streams bill is what that one's referred to. Uh, but I just want you to think about the different water body types on your golf courses. Um, this was an infograph put out during the Trump administration that showed the difference between federal and state jurisdiction. Those water bodies in bold on the left side of the screen, federal jurisdiction. Those smaller bodies, water bodies on the, on the right that are not bolded, those would be state jurisdiction. So you know, ponds and wetlands that are not connected to these federal bodies of water. Ephemeral streams were not included in the Trump rule. Those were left to the states to regulate. So the reason this is important is because on your average golf course, it's 150 acres, on average, 11 of those are streams, ponds, lakes, or wetlands. Now, obviously this differs greatly if you're in Florida, it's probably far, high, far higher than 11 acres. If you're in Arizona, it's probably less. Um, nevertheless, that's the average. And so what the Biden administration has done is they've conducted a two-step process to repeal the Trump rule and implement one of their own. As I mentioned, it's a little bit more expansive, bringing ephemeral streams under federal jurisdiction. They also use significant nexus language that basically is, is very broad and vague and says that if a water body has a significant nexus to a federal body of water, it would fall under federal jurisdiction. Why is this important? Because that then requires federal permits to conduct activities in and around those bodies of water, including very small creeks and streams. If you want to realign a stream bank so that the water flows better, it could require a federal permit. If you want to replace a cart bridge, that could require a federal permit. Certain spraying activities around these body, bodies of water could require a federal permit. We think that's a little bit um, unnecessary around really small bodies of water. We think it's far better to work with your state or your local water authority, as Bob and I were discussing earlier, uh, on, on some of those permits and activities. That's why we focus so much on this rule. So uh, we've led the industry on written comments to the EPA and the Corps of Engineers through each uh, rulemaking process. We've participated in the Waters Advocacy Coalition that includes a number of other industries that really are not connected to golf in any way, but have similar interests to ours when it comes to water policy, including the Farm Bureau, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, Home Builders, etc. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Biden rule might be upended by a Supreme Court case that uh, is called the Sackett case. Uh, they heard this case last fall. They will make a decision on this case this spring. It basically comes down to the Sackett family in Idaho owned a piece of property they wanted to build a house on that was near a federal water. Uh, the EPA came in and said they had not secured the correct permit to build that house, and they were going to fine them $30,000 a day if they continued with construction. They decided to take this to court, and it's made its, all, its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And again, we'll have a decision uh, this spring. We've said all along, no WOTUS before SCOTUS. It's irresponsible to move forward with a rulemaking when you have a court case that could completely change that rulemaking. Okay, so that's enough on federal waters. Uh, there's plenty of other water policy topics that we could discuss. 
But that's kind of been the big game in town for the past eight years. Let's move on to pesticide policy. We tackle this from both a legislative and a regulatory angle. Um, first on the legislative side, GCSA is consist uh, consistently working to educate congressional staff on Capitol Hill on the need for an appropriate use of pesticide products. So why do we need to do this? Well, it's critical, especially with freshman lawmakers and staff who maybe don't have a background uh, in land management or pesticide applications, to have a better understanding of the current laws and regulations on the books uh, regulating pesticides. Primarily that would be FIFRA, that's the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And that's been law in the United States since the 1970s as well. So when you think about the fact that 20% of U.S. House members will be freshmen this year, 2023, there's a lot of educating that has to go on. In fact, I liked on the uh, slide that showed Bob when he, when he was up here receiving the award, standing in front of the Capitol, and what did it say on it? It didn't say lobbying, it didn't say advocacy. What did it say? It said education. That's what this is all about, educating lawmakers and staff about what we're doing as an industry to be good environmental stewards, also educating them on laws and regs currently on the books. A lot of lawmakers get elected and they want to you know, go to their state capitol or go to Washington, D.C. and do something, right? Make some change. Well, they do so sometimes without an understanding of what's currently law. And, and FIFRA is there to regulate every as aspect of pesticide manufacturing, you know, label creation that goes on every pesticide product that all happens through the EPA, distribution, storage of pesticides, and ultimately application of pesticides, including on golf courses. Uh, we place a huge emphasis on uh, cultural practices and how specific pests and disease, diseases impact turf grass, and the use of IPM, that's Integrated Pest Management, which is basically the foundation for healthy turf grass management, and, and sort of lays out and demonstrates you know, the scouting and the study and the understanding of every single pest threat uh, to a turf grass system, the last step in IPM is potentially a pesticide application if that's going to be the best control method for a certain threat. So we continue to focus on the jurisdictional committees in Congress that regulate pesticide use. Now we are in the legislative arena here, so occasionally we'll get a bill at the federal level. More often we get them at the state level, but occasionally we get them at the federal level that would impact pesticide applicators. Uh, in this example is Senate 269, introduced this year by Senator Cory Booker. He's introduced this bill the last three Congresses. And of course, they like to give these bills really scary names to grab your attention, right? So they call this one the Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticides Act. Very scary. Um, and so what this bill would do is immediately ban neonic and organophosphate products. Uh, neonic products, we were chatting earlier, are critical for the control of a couple of things in particular. White grubs, which feed on the roots of turf grass and can cause great damage, especially to golf greens. Uh, not only do the grubs kill the grass, but then they invite in predators that feed on the grubs. Think burrowing critters, okay, skunks, uh, gophers, moles, uh, things of that nature that can cause great damage to your golf course. Uh, neonic products, and, and this imidacloprid is kind of the primary active ingredient. You'll find them in a product like Merit. Um, they're also used for the control of emerald ash borer, which Cornell University has called the most destructive pest in North American history to the tune of about a billion dollars a year. The destruction they've done to ash trees all, all over the country is quite devastating. So that's a problem. Here's a solution, a neonicotinoid insecticide. Yet, this bill would do away with that. Uh, the bill also removes state pesticide preemption laws. Preemption laws at the state level lay out that only the state government, in conjunction with the EPA, will regulate pesticide use in a state. Why is that necessary? Well, that's, that's so that uh, local governments, cities, towns, counties, aren't implementing their own pesticide restrictions that go beyond the state and create confusion for applicators. 46 states across the country currently have pesticide preemption laws. This bill would do away with those so that every local government could implement their own restrictions and bans. Uh, that's not only bad news for applicators, that's bad news for the education, certification, and training that they go through, which needs to be sort of uh, consistent across the state level to be effective. Finally, it would ban any chemical that's already banned by the European Union or any one EU country. We think we have a pretty good regulatory system here in the United States, and we don't really want to turn that over to 
the EU. The graph that you see there is uh, from an action alert we ran on this bill a couple of years ago, uh, where we made it quite easy for our members to send messages to their members of Congress uh, opposing the bill. So for a final look at this, side-by-side -side look at, at FIFRA versus PACPA. Uh, under FIFRA, pesticides are distributed or sold in the U.S. are registered with the EPA and re-registered every 15 years. So the EPA is constantly looking at fresh data on usage uh, and addressing the labels as needed. And again, the label is the law. The label lays out how a pesticide you know, can uh, be, be, be applied, in what rates, at what time of year, etc. cetera. Uh, pesticides must demonstrate no harm to human health or the environment. And again, the label is the law. So we absolutely support FIFRA. We're pro-regulation when it comes to FIFRA, and we oppose the PAC the bill. On the regulatory side, uh, we do, we've recently hosted a webinar series on a number of different active ingredients, oxidiazon, PCMB, thiophenate, methyl, and then rodenticides, which is sort of a different class of their own. Uh, but these are four products that the EPA has currently looked at changing the labels to, which would impact the way in which superintendents can use those products. Uh, the thiophenate methyl period, uh, comment period is currently ongoing, which is the time in which superintendents, green committee chairman, really anyone at all, can weigh in on the proposed changes by the EPA. The EPA goes through this registration process. I won't dive too far into that. The next to last arrow is the pro proposed interim decision, which is currently where you find, find thiophenate methyl in the process. Um, the comment deadline for thiophenate methyl comments is March 23rd. So this is currently open. We're getting comments from superintendents. You can submit comments again through our action alert system that go directly to the EPA docket. So if thiophenate methyl is a fungicide, it's important to you and your work on the golf course, I would uh, highly encourage you to take a look at what's being proposed by the EPA and weigh in to let them know how this would impact your operations one way or another. Okay, we've heard a little bit about labor today. Uh, labor has been the biggest challenge for golf course superintendents uh, for a number of years now, at least five or six years. This has come back as the number one biggest challenge on our member needs survey. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of uh, policy solutions for labor challenges. Every industry out there is facing them, not just golf. It's hard to find a reliable workforce. One thing that we have seen used in golf, um, and it comes and goes in terms of how many courses use it year to year, uh, but that would be the H2B seasonal labor program, uh, whereby workers come into the United States to do a job for a year, and they return home to their home country uh, at the end of the season. So it's a program that fits a need quite well for golf, especially in parts of the country where you know, we're not doing golf course maintenance uh, year round across the entire course, of course it ramps up during the season. And this program fits that need quite well. The only problem with it is there's only 66,000 visas given out each year by the federal government. Golf is competing with landscaping, construction, uh, seafood processing, uh, meat packing, all these industries that need manual labor, as golf does, they all compete for this same small amount of visas. And that number was set by Congress in the 1990s and hasn't changed significantly. So what are we advocating for? Well, the need is out there. Uh, this year, this fiscal year, there are 211,000 labor certifications issued by the Department of Labor. Okay, so those are employers uh, who have gotten certified by DOL to bring in H2B labor. But remember that each of those employers is not asking for one visa. They're likely asking for multiple visas. So the need is absolutely there. The bottom of the slide says the demand exceeds the supply of visas by three to one, and that's certainly the case. So um, again, we, we've asked for more visas. In for, for FY23, the Department of Homeland Security announced that 64,000 uh, additional visas would be released, nearly doubling right the size of the program, but it's only for one year. It's a band-aid, it's not a permanent fix. And a permanent fix is what we're after because employers need uh, certainty from one year to the next that they're gonna have the crew required to manage their golf course. So uh, that permanent solution was introduced last Congress in the form of the Returning Worker Exception Act uh, by Congressman Cuellar. We don't know if he's gonna uh, introduce this bill again this year or some version of it. We are certainly uh, asking him to or, or another sponsor to introduce a similar bill that would provide a three-year returning worker exemption. What that means is if a worker has been here one of the three previous years, they wouldn't count towards the cap 
when coming back. So you think of that 66,000 cap as only for first time workers. That provides the cap relief we need to have predictability within the program. Um, just trying to think if there was another comment I was gonna make on H2B. Aside from the H2B program, uh, Mike mentioned our partnership and, and work through the veterans program to bring more people into the industry. That's certainly a, a good avenue. Uh, we also have partnered recently with the Future Farmers of America to you know, convey to their young people, members of that association, that uh, there's a future in golf course management as well. So say you've got a, a kid that grows up on a farm, works on the farm you know, as a youngster, but isn't in a position to take over the farm when he or she graduates high school, maybe moves to the city or a suburb, wants to continue working with their hands outdoors. We want them to know, hey, you can stay in the uh, agronomic field, come work on a golf course. So we're hoping that uh, our partnership with FFA produces maybe the next crop of superintendents alongside with these veterans programs. Mike talked about the first green as well. I'll touch on that at the end of my remarks. But we need a solution now for our, uh, for our industry's uh, issues with labor and the HDB program could be that fix. We just need more visas. Very quickly, a uh, new initiative this year, we partnered with the National Turfgrass Federation to try to implement a program in this year's Farm Bill uh, that will fund turfgrass research. Um, as we know, you know, new cultivars of turfgrass are incredibly important to what golf course superintendents do. Um, and so, you know, through this program, we're going to point out to lawmakers that here's why turfgrass is important. It's all around us. We find it uh, in our residential areas. We recreate on it, whether it's sports fields or on golf courses. We find it in places where we work, we find it on the roadside. You know, it has a lot of aesthetic value, sure, and it can help property value, there's no doubt. But a lot of lawmakers don't realize the environmental benefits that turf grass also provides, including erosion control, flood control, healthy turf grass sequesters carbon, it filters storm water, and it traps particulate matter out of the air. So, put simply, turf grass really can be and is uh, the Earth's air filter, water filter. It traps pollutants, it recharges groundwater, and this is something that policymakers need to know. So through our partnership with the National Turfgrass Federation, uh, we're promoting research. Out of, this is out of their white paper. They say research has been instrumental for creating new cultivars, addressing water and pesticide reduction, soil erosion mitigation, and pollutant runoff into streams and waterways. Those are all things we talk about all the time at GCSAA in the government affairs space, and this is what a lot of our best management practices are all about as well. So our ask is to establish a National Turfgrass Research Initiative, which is a competitive, competitive grant funding program under the research title of the next Farm Bill. Congress passes a Farm Bill every five years. It's one of the few pieces of legislation that uh, truly is bipartisan and gets overwhelming support. It's almost a guarantee that the Farm Bill is going to pass every five years. So if we can get a program like this into the Farm Bill, it would be a huge win. Uh, it would fund the program annually at $20 million. You know, the USDA does a ton of research on food crops and has uh, for their entire existence, but they've not put as much emphasis on turf grass. When you consider that turf grass is the third largest uh, crop in the United States, I think it's important that we get more research into turf grass. Um, so you can imagine what you know the others are. I think corn, soybeans, wheat, etc. Uh, but we think there ought to be some research going into turf grass as well. So I'm not going to read the whole slide here, but. Um, what the program would address is, is, again, research into turf grasses that are drought and heat tolerant for more water savings. This is critically important, especially out west. Um, turf grasses that are pest resistant and uh, allow us to reduce pesticide usage uh, that are more nutrient resource use efficient as well. There are a number of other important topics. Uh, entities that would be available to, or, or eligible rather, to uh, apply and compete for these grants would be your state ag experiment stations, Colleges and universities, university foundations, other research institutions, etc. So when, we're, when we work on an issue like this, we try to identify key lawmakers. Uh, here's some from the New York region that are on the House and Senate Ag Committees that we will certainly be talking to uh, in promotion of this program, trying to get it authorized in the Farm Bill. Okay, so those are a few of the federal topics that I wanted to highlight for you. Uh, I want to give you a, a bit of a case study as well, and this one comes at the state level. Um, I do think that I'm on track here, so, uh, but we're going to go kind of fast. 
There's an article on this on the thumb drive that you'll be receiving that I wrote for Golf Course Management Magazine last year, but a bill was introduced in Colorado that would have done two things concerning the golf course superintendents. It would have uh, restricted the use of neonicotinoid products, which we just talked about, and it would have also uh, rolled back pesticide preemption in the state, again, allowing local governments to regulate in their own way uh, pesticide products. The reason I point this out is we see very similar bills each year in a number of different states, but especially in New York. You may have heard of the Bird and Bees Act uh, that's been introduced, oh gosh, how many years in a row now, uh, Bob? I mean, gosh, we're looking at four or five years, something like that. Um, Luckily, we've been able to, to stop it from passing, but there's always a great chance that it could pass every single year. In Connecticut, they're dealing with the neonic bill right now uh, as well. So it's something that comes up commonly. In Colorado, the superintendents did a fantastic job organizing, understanding the issue, reaching out to lawmakers, putting together testimony, and ultimately, on the day of the hearing in front of the Senate Ag Committee, delivering that testimony. The hearing started about 1 o'clock, lasted until well into the night, 8 o'clock or later, when the superintendents uh, got up to testify. So there was a lot of testimony, both in favor of the bill and opposed to the bill. Uh, but the superintendents involved there just did a really great job with their testimony, talking about the envir environmental benefits that communities across Colorado uh, get from those golf courses, and really highlighting best management practices on their course as well. So when it came time to vote, uh, you know, the majority certainly had the numbers to pass the bill out of the committee if they wanted to. Senator Rhonda Fields was not the sponsor of the bill, but her colleague was. And, you know, as you know, it's kind of hard to go against your, your, your colleague on the same side of the aisle. When someone introduces a bill, they expect you to support it. But she heard the testimony all day, and she had a really interesting closing statement. She came back and said, my understanding, having talked to the ad community and those who run golf courses, that the preemption piece would be out of the bill. And that would move them to a neutral position. And when they came to testify, and I felt like their testimony was very compelling, it was very strong, they were not in a neutral position. So I'll skip down to the end. I'm really sorry to the bill sponsor. I really wanted to be a yes, but I'm compelled to be on the side of the voices I heard today. Very strong voice, voices as it related to the impact on the work that they do. The approach we're taking here tonight is the wrong approach, I'm a no. Okay, so that just goes to show that when you engage when you do the outreach to lawmakers, when you put together compelling testimony and talk about the work that's done on your golf course day in and day out, and how legislators could potentially be impacting that, you can make a difference. I know that you probably can't read this, but this is sort of a handful of bills introduced this year at the state level uh, that would deal with very similar topics. We talked about neonic restrictions, preemption rollback, Etc. Lots of bills in Connecticut, New York, and, uh, and some in New Jersey that we'll talk about a little bit too. California housing bill, I'm not going to go deep into this one, but this touched on land use. Sure, we get pressures on water, pesticide, fertilizer, you know, some of these other areas. Land use is another one where, where you see golf courses sort of under attack across the country. I'm just going to tell you, because I know it's been the case in New York that there's ideas about development on golf courses, highest and best use. You hear these sorts of things around sort of property tax discussions. The blueprint for how to stop this kind of legislation, uh, it comes from California over the last two years when um, a few iterations of this bill that would have used state funds to incentivize municipal governments to close their municipal golf courses and redevelopment, redevelop them as high density residential and commercial developments. Golf industry in California did a phenomenal job coming together, opposing each iteration of this bill. The Southern California Golf Association called it the most damaging piece of golf legislation to be filed in a generation. It was really true. Uh, and so through three iterations of the bill, we were able to stop it over the course of two years. This was a tweet from the sponsor that said she was very disappointed that the bill was held in uh, assembly appropriations, but it's not over. She'll try again. So she did. She took a whack at this three different times. Uh, so I'm just telling you, if, if, you're, if you're facing pressure locally or at a state level on you know, the land that your golf course sits on and other ways in which it can be used, the blueprint for defeating such a legislation comes out of California. Uh, we ran an actual word on it, plenty of great topic, talking points, plenty of great responses from our members, our to legislators there. Happy to do the same here in New York and elsewhere if necessary. Uh, power equipment I wanted to touch on really quickly um, because we're seeing more and more bills come at the state level. This started in California, but 
There's a lot of focus on gasoline-powered engines, especially 25 horsepower and smaller. Uh, and states wanting to do away with that equipment. Of course, a lot of it's really important in golf course management. We're not just talking leaf blowers and weed eaters. Uh, we're also talking about riding mowers, push, uh, push mowers, green mowers, fairway units. I mean, you name it, chainsaws, power washers, snow blowers, uh, all that have engines that would fall within some of the regulation that we're seeing. Um, here's a few bills specifically. Uh, New Jersey has a bill this year that would prohibit the use of gas-powered lawn equipment uh, starting in the very near future. New York sets their date at 2029 in which they would do away with this. Oregon's 2026. So we felt it was important to develop a position on power equipment use and, and availability for golf courses. Just like pesticides and anything else, the National Association is not going to tell superintendents what type of equipment to use. We're fighting for product availability and product choice. Um, we need this equipment to get us through. Is electrification and automation, we heard Mike McCall talk about automated equipment, is that the future? Certainly it could be. It would be great if it was, but we gotta get there and the technology is not quite there on a commercial scale. I heard it said that, you know, we didn't get the iPhone by banning the flip phone, right? We didn't get the automobile by uh, banning the horse and buggy. You know, innovation in this country happens, but we have to let it run its course. And so we need power equipment in the near term. How do we address some of these challenges? And then uh, I will wrap up quickly. Um, the grassroots ambassador program is one way. Uh, through this program that I manage, we pair golf course superintendents with members of Congress that represent them. Uh, Bob Nielsen's in the, bas the, in the ambassador program, as is Mark Weston, uh, Luke Knudsen, Brett Chapin. A lot of superintendents here participate in the grassroots ambassador program, and I sincerely appreciate uh, their, their participation in that program and their advocacy. The Public Affairs Council in Washington, D.C. says, you want to you influence Congress? Try showing up. Advocating in person. Building a relationship. That's the way to go. Sure, we can pick up the phone. Sure, we can write emails and letters. But really, the way to get through and cut through all the noise of the day-to-day -day news cycle and political cycle is, uh, is through relationships. And you've got to do that by showing up in person. So you don't have to go to Washington, D.C. to do it. You can do it here at home, you can do it at your golf course. We, we really encourage golf course site visits, uh, bringing lawmakers or regulators out to your property to show them all the things that you do to manage your property in an environmentally uh, sensitive uh, way. And we heard examples of that when Bob received his award, all the things that he's done through best management practices. That's great, but lawmakers and regulators have to know it. And so that's what we do in the Grassroots Ambassador Program. Kyle Barton is an ambassador. He, uh, he's in the Chicago area now, but previously he was in Michigan, paired with Congresswoman Kelly Stevens. She visited his property. He put a moisture meter in her hands, had her take some moisture readings on a green, took her around, showed her different aspects of the property, and she said, as a member of Congress, I appreciate hearing from constituents like Kyle who are engaged in advocacy and are a resource for me and my staff in the district. That's what it's all about. Uh, so if you're ready to advocate for golf and want to join the program, we'd love to have you. You know, I think there's a real opportunity for golf to be more influential in the advocacy space because it's not just superintendents, but then we think about green committee chairmen that are here, the network that you have, the network that your committee members might have, the network that your club members might have. We never know where we have relationships and connections to lawmakers that are making decisions that impact the way golf courses are managed. So that's why you get involved. We provide education for our ambassadors to help them with developing tough messaging and how to have tough conversations with lawmakers, but certainly in a respectful way. And, and what are the best practices for public speaking and providing testimony? It's not an easy thing to do, and we want to make sure our ambassadors are prepared to do it. Finally, if ambassadors are the messenger, uh, BMPs, best management practices, are often the message. Everything we talk about ties back to best management practices. Every single state across the country now has a best management practices guide at the state level. And now we're on the next phase of facility adoption, really encouraging golf facilities to adopt their best management practices guide at the state level and tailor it to the needs of their golf course. New York has led the way in this area. New York's been involved in BMPs going back to at least 2014, I think, Bob, in terms of you know, really producing a manual that we can point to to, uh, to defend the way in which golf courses are managed. BMPs are the language of regulators. They truly understand when you're talk what you're talking about when you talk about best management practices because these are in a number of industries, not golf. But golf's BMPs are quite thorough. There's uh, typically 12 different sections uh, covering the way in which golf courses are managed, managed talking about pollinator protection, 
and a number of other uh, important topics. They're used, uh, they're used for advocacy purposes, certainly, and I, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Kim Benoit, uh, who is the executive director of the, Na the New York Golf Course Foundation, has been quite involved in BMP development and implementation here in the state of New York, and uh, Kim won the 2023 Excellence in Government Affairs Award from GCSAA. Uh, so again, Ken's been quite involved. I know yesterday he was doing a, a workshop with a number of superintendents a little bit north of here that Kevin Doyle was telling me about. Um, again, talking about how to implement uh, the state's BMP manual, but do, doing so at the facility level. Michael Call already mentioned the First Green program to you, but I would encourage you to take a look at this. If you want to learn more about the First Green, just simply Google GCSAA First Green, and you'll find out more about this program, which brings... Um, students out to golf courses and turns the golf course into a bit of a learning laboratory for uh, a day or half day. Um, typically, you know, upper elementary, but certainly middle school and high school students. Uh, just a great way to demonstrate to young people uh, some environmental principles and educate them on some of these things. Keep it simple, but it is all about uh, STEM education um, and having them, you know, get on a golf course. Mike mentioned it, maybe it's a long-term proposition, but just putting it in their heads that, you know, this could be a career. Working on a golf course is something that you can do for a lifetime. Uh, and beyond, you know, the kids that come to the course, we see a, a great impact on the, on the chaperones and teachers and parents that come out as well who might not have much exposure to golf. Maybe they don't play, maybe they've never been a member of a club, uh, but getting them out there and letting them know that this is about a lot more than just the game of golf uh, is really cool. Um, sometimes some golf instruction is included as well. So again, we know that golf, golf courses are all about golf, but they're also about a lot of uh, positive environmental things as well. So that's what we do through the First Green Program. Uh, to wrap up, I wanted to mention that we are headed back to Washington, D.C. this year, first time since uh, 2019 due to the pandemic. But we are going back to National Golf Day, May 8th through 10th. Great, great event to participate in. Um, love to have superintendents there. We'd love superintendents to bring along. Green committee chairman. Uh, so if this is an event that you want to be a part of, again, you can scan that code or uh, throw it into Google and register for National Golf Day by April 10. Uh, we expect to have well over 300 participants this year. National Golf Day has really grown year after year. We go to Capitol Hill on Wednesday for our lobby day. We'll have over 200, probably close to 300 congressional office meetings to discuss some of the issues I've discussed here with you uh, today. The Tuesday prior to our lobby day, we'll be doing once again our community service project on the National Mall. Uh, believe it or not, the mall can be uh, in kind of rough shape here and there. National Park Service is short on staff, as everyone is, so they appreciate any volunteers that can come out and help take care of what's called uh, the nation's front yard. So not only do we do some turf projects on the mall, you know, including mowing, uh, aerating, seating, uh, sod installation, etc. Uh, but we work in the national monuments around the mall as well, um, putting our putting our agronomic skills to work. So uh, it's just been a phenomenal event, and uh, we look forward to doing that again this year. Of course, everything we do in advocacy is is not done alone at GCSAA. We appreciate the support of all of our allied associations throughout the country. Uh, as well. I want to recognize them on the screen. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Maybe there's time for a question or two, uh, but I wanted to put my contact info large on the screen there for you, so feel free to take a picture of it and reach out to me anytime if you have any questions about what we're doing in government affairs at GCSAA and how we might be able to help. Thank you very much.